My grandfather had a tendency to overdo things. As I poured over his machine tools after I inherited them, I discovered duplicates, triplicates, and even quadruplicates of many things. By no means is this a problem. Rather, I bring it up as a possible reason for why I, too, am a chronic overdoer. In the last video, I started making this nifty sign plate, but I severely underestimated how nuts I would go with the surface grinder, so it's not done. While it could probably be used in its current state, I feel compelled to make some additional hardware that would really polish off this build. So join me in my madness as I spend a bit more time making some somewhat unnecessary parts and take this thing for a test spin. When we left off, I had precision ground the top and bottom plates, as well as fabricated the hinge pin, rest pin, and hinge caps. This magnetic chuck will be mounting right to this face, but I'd really like a consistent reference point to position it against as I take it on and off. That's what this slot is for, or more accurately, what this key stock that will go in the slot is for. Let's head over to the mill and make some chips. The final bar will be shorter, but I'll start machining with the whole stock, just in case I make a mistake. The first operation is to square the end of the material to make it not only look good, but also give a nice face to reference from. With the spindle positioned at the center of the stock, I can begin to drill the series of holes. The two holes on either end are drilled and counterboard for screws that will hold this key in place. Then the three holes in the middle are simple through holes that will lead to some threaded holes we already made in the sign plate. And of course we can't move on without dropping an itty bitty little chamfer on each of these. We'll cut this off long with the bandsaw before remounting it in the mill upside down and backwards. This leaves the saw and end free for milling to length, and also leaves the bottoms of the holes accessible for chamfers as well. Then that's basically it for the key. Good job, Brandon. You made something simple. When I milled this slot previously, I made it a very snug fit so the key always holds the same position. And yes, you are looking at stainless steel hardware. Need I remind you of the theme of this video? I think that will overdo just fine. That was a nice warm up, but let's do something a little more interesting. The mag chuck came with its own set of hold down clamps, but they're not very attractive. So shockingly, I decided to make my own. I didn't think I had to buy some corrosion resistant 4140 for these parts, so I'm stuck with some mild carbon steel that I had in the stockpile. But I've got a solution for that corrosion problem. First, we'll get the stock down to working dimension. With all six faces square, I'll switch to the bevel insert cutter to make this clearance pocket. I cleaned this tool up in a previous video, and I'm surprised how much I find myself using it. It's like it was specifically designed just to make things look nicer. In the case of these parts, this pocket will give clearance to go over the key we just made. In the same setup, I'll mill the slots for the clamping bolts. A center drill on each end of the stock lets me plunge right through with an end mill without having to work so hard. And doing this on each end of the stock means I only have to clean up one face after I cut these to length. It was about this time I realized I totally missed the width by a full quarter inch when I squared up the stock. That won't do at all. After some somewhat creative fixturing, I was able to mill that down to the intended dimension. I guess it's better to accidentally leave too much material than to have removed it. Over on the bandsaw, I'll cut away the center, then hop back over to the mill to clean up those last faces. In hindsight, this probably wasn't the best way to hold these pieces due to the potential for uneven clamping pressure, but nothing blew up in my face, so as my grandfather would say, don't get your shorts in a knot. Next, I'll file some nice chamfers on all the corners, clean off all the oils with some brake cleaner, and then bust out the big old bucket of blue and dunk these little guys until they look nice and toasty. This black oxide coating in combination with the sealing compound should do well to prevent these from rusting anytime soon. With the clamps made and treated, there's nothing stopping us from finally mounting the magnetic chuck on here. That seems fairly secure. Technically, we can move on to working on the collet box, but there's still one more piece needed to make this look like a big boy sign plate. That being a locking strap. This will give me a means to lock the sign plate at the desired angle without lifting up off the gauge blocks. I didn't think ahead on this one either, so more low carbon steel it is. I'm also not 100% sure on how I'll hold this part in the coming operations, so I'm cutting the stock a bit larger than I'll need. 
The steel is also twice as thick as what I want, so we'll face mill this to the right thickness. First just a light skim on one side, then I'll flip this over and mill it the rest of the way down. I'm taking this down to an eighth inch thick, which doesn't leave me much material to hang on to. But just in case I'm being fairly conservative with the passes, so this thing doesn't jump out of the vise and bite me. Now we can set up for the fun st wait a minute. Somehow this plate is no longer flat. It's practically a potato chip. We've already made it this far, so let's see if we can force it back into shape with the press. If I had to venture a guess, this plate was probably cold rolled and thus had a lot of residual internal stresses. As soon as I remove that material unevenly, the stress is relaxed, resulting in a severe potato chipification. But my ham-handed press job seems to have worked. That's probably not dead nuts, but it sure beats the potato chip tolerance as I was getting before. Now the remainder of this part will be made on one of my favorite tools, the rotary table. All of the coming operations will reference the center of this table, so I'll find that center with another one of my favorite tools, the coaxial indicator. Since I'll be going through the part, I've prepared a sacrificial plate of aluminum to go underneath the steel to protect the surface of the table. And to help position the material, I'm using a paper template of the final part. I'd hate to get halfway through this operation, only to discover that one of the features goes beyond the edges of my material. Let's do this thing. First I'll center drill for the pivot hole and all the areas that will get plunged with an end mill. Next I'll drill the pivot hole all the way through. Then switching to the 3 8 end mill, I can cut the curved slot by rotating the rotary table. I don't really know why I decided to do this with a series of plunge cuts, but it does the job. A final pass on each side smooths out the choppy cut marks. The outer arc is next and this time no plunge cuts. Just a parting cut and a skim cut. Before cutting the inner arc, I'll rearrange the clamps making sure I always have at least one holding this in place so I don't lose my references. Then the inner arc is cut the same way as the outer. Now I want the ends to look nice too, so we're not done with the rotary table just yet. Repositioning to the center of the table, I can use an end mill to center the part on the pivot hole. And then clamp that down and mill a nice radius on each end. This isn't exactly a precision setup, but this also isn't a precision feature, so I'm okay with that. That looks great, but I haven't quite overdone it yet. Let's surface grind this. Not only will grinding make this look nicer, but having a consistent thickness will make this mechanism function a lot smoother as well. Like I mentioned before, this is only a low carbon steel, so to prevent it from rusting, we'll give it the black oxide and sealer treatment like the chuck clamps. Now I could mount this right to the side of the sign plate, but then it would end up scratching these nicely ground faces, and we can't have that. Using the leftover 4140 steel bar from the rest pins, I'll turn down a few simple washers. The ones on the inboard side of the strap have a shoulder feature for keeping everything in position, and the ones on the outside help spread out the clamping forces of the screws. Well doesn't that just look spiffy? And the whole thing operates buttery smooth. You can see how the curved shape of the locking strap prevents it from extending up beyond the top face of the sign plate. And the locking screws don't really need much torque to hold everything securely. I think this will do nicely. Now this sign plate is 100% complete. But before we can use it, I still need to do some more stuff. The magnetic chuck that I'm mounting to the top of this, while brand new, still needs some work to get it ready to use. First, let's clean off the protective gunk. Wow, that's really satisfying. I could do this all day. One end of the base will rest against the key we put in the sign plate, but this painted edge is all wonky. So I'll set this up in the middle and skim that edge clean and square. Now when I position this on the sign plate, it will always register in the same position. We'll go ahead and mount this now and move over to the grinder. Just like any other chuck, and per the manufacturer's instructions, this needs to be ground in. The first step is the top face. Right off the bat you can see this face wasn't parallel to the base. Once the whole face is cleared, we can flip this over and repeat the process for the bottom. This side is aluminum, which is apparently a bit more difficult to grind than steel. I had pretty good success last time when I ground the aluminum bottom of the magnetic chuck on this grinder, but that doesn't seem to be the case here. The problem is that the aluminum sticks to the wheel in big clumps and ends up ruining the surface finish and dimension. I spent way too long trying everything at my disposal, using the coarsest wheel I have, coating the wheel with wax, redressing after each pass, 
I even went nuts with the coolant, but nothing seemed to work. And now this face is so screwed up that I don't even feel good about mounting with it. So I'm going to go over to the mill and try and get it at least a little better. In order to get the most consistent surface possible, I want to fly cut this face. The only problem is the largest fly cutter I have isn't quite wide enough to cover the whole face in one pass. But I've got an idea. I'm going to try fly cutting with a boring head. Call it flat boring. Other than maybe being a little rough on the head, I don't know why this wouldn't work. Just as a precaution though, I'll keep everything tight on the head and only take one to two thou passes at a time. I'm pretty impressed with that actually. I'll figure out how to properly grind aluminum eventually, but for now this will do just fine. Mounted back right side up on the sign plate, and with the magnet engaged, I'll do the final dusting of the top. Now, after all that work, this massive thing is finally ready to use. If you've made it this far without knowing what a sign plate is, I commend your patience. The time has finally come for me to explain. A sign plate is a tool for holding parts at very precise angles. You set the angles by placing gauge blocks under the rest pin, and you figure out how tall of a gauge block you need by using a sign function, hence the name sign plate. Now why do I need this tool? I suppose I don't technically, but obviously I like to overdo things, and it will make correcting the wonky angles on the collet block a heck of a lot easier. I made these in a previous video and have basically spent the last three months trying to fix them. My thinking is that I can set this at a true 60 degree angle and work my way through the faces until they're all correct. Simple enough, except I've already run into my first problem. I can't quite get the sign plate to open up enough to set this at the 60 degree angle I need. Apparently I cut it too close when milling the angled reliefs on the hinge. There's no getting around this one. Does it count as a side project if it's just a correction to a project that's already complete? Apparently, yes. I'm going to shave a little more relief off of each block near the hinge. Rather than tilt the mill head to a 30 degree angle again, I'll just tilt the plate using an angle block. This is just a clearance cut, so precision isn't important. But I'm not a barbarian, so I will use an indicator to make sure the part is level. A 5,000 skim cut should do it. This small adjustment on each plate will translate to a lot more out by the rest pin. Let's get this all back together and see if that fixed the issue. And the answer is yes. But now I've discovered yet another problem. I was planning to indicate the collet block into the position on the chuck and then activate the magnet to hold it fully in place. But the holding force isn't quite what I was expecting. I'll need something rigid to prevent the block from sliding down. Fortunately, the chuck came with this end rail. So we'll get this on here and move over to the surface grinder to true it up. With the sign plate resting against the grinder's side rail, I can cut the top and side of the sign plate chuck's end rail. This ensures the rail ends up parallel to the end of the sign plate. Now when I position a collet block against it, I know it's not going anywhere and will also be true to the sign plate. Well, sort of. That will only work if all the faces of the collet block are parallel to the block's axis. And right now that is not the case. So before we can even fix the angles, we have to fix the faces. It's at this point that time starts to lose all meaning and things get a little disjointed. So allow me to give you the distilled essence of the process. Firstly, I'm mounting a precision shaft, in my case an end mill, with the collet and the collet block. This will give me the best approximation of the block's center axis. I can then use a surface gauge as a height comparator to measure the variation between two points an inch apart on the shaft. This is telling me that the bottom face of this block is off parallel by eight ten thousandths per inch. And here's where the sign plate comes in. 8 tenths per inch translates to about 6 thou per 8 inches. So that's the size gauge block I need under my sign plate rest pin. A 6 thou gauge block doesn't exist, but a 106 thou block does. And that's why the sign plate rest pin has a reduced diameter on one end, leaving exactly a 100 thou step. As a sanity check, we can verify the correct angle using the height comparator once again. A zero deviation means the shaft is parallel and the math worked out perfectly. Over on the grinder we can cut the top face of this setup to bring it parallel to the center axis. Then mount that side face down on the primary mag chuck to true it up to the first. That gives me two faces parallel to the axis and we can just repeat the process to true up the rest of the faces. Once everything is parallel to the axis we can actually move on to fixing the angles. Using the gauge stack from before, I'll set the sign plate to 60 degrees and mount the first block. Resting this against the stop we ground in earlier should result in this center axis being perfectly horizontal. 
However, the comparator reveals this is not the case. On the bright side, I'm pretty sure I know why. I squared this end rail using the end face of the sign plate as a reference. But that end face is only milled, so it's likely off square a bit. I didn't grind the end square before because I simply didn't have the clearance on the grinder. I do have a project in mind though that will help me with this, but it will have to wait. A simple shim will get me by for now. I'll be honest, this whole setup is a fair bit larger than I envisioned. I'm at the limits of my grinder's reach, and this isn't even that big of a part. Overdoing it might be an understatement. Never mind the literal hundreds of hours of shop time spanned across multiple months, projects, and videos. I'll have to spend about three minutes grinding a very precise 60 degree angle. Okay, maybe it was to grind six angles, but still. Let's see how I did. My best chance at inspection is with a precision angle block against the faces. I almost can't believe my eyes. Not even a fraction of a hint of a sliver of light getting through any of those faces. They're absolutely dead nuts. I think I just impressed myself. That almost never happens. The last set of operations on this cog block is to grind all the faces down to the same distance from the center axis. Then basically repeat that whole process over again for the square block. And with that, the call-it blocks are, dare I say it, complete. Since I screwed these up when I made them months ago, I've been methodically working my way towards fixing them. First was to get the grinder cleaned up and operational, and let's not forget my overly optimistic first attempt at correcting the blocks. The grinder then played an important part in making the surface gauge, which turned out to be a bit more involved than I anticipated. And finally, both of these projects played a crucial role in making this sign plate. All this just to fix some call-it blocks I could have bought for 50 bucks. But you know what? I wouldn't have it any other way. The lessons I've learned will never be forgotten, and the pride I have for the tools I made with my own two hands simply can't be beat. But this three-month-long wild goose chase has left this shop a little worse for wear. And I have a whole stack of side projects I've been putting off. As always, thanks for watching, and see you next time.